All right, picking up from the last video, there are four types of discrimination that we've already alluded to. There's wage discrimination where one group makes more than another group, and that would be based on irrelevant characteristics to the job. Um, employment discrimination, which is where uh, one group has lower unemployment than another group. Another way of putting it, one group has more employment prospects than another group. Uh, and the employment is being based on irrelevant characteristics such as race or gender. And then there's occupational segregation. Now, this is an interesting one because when you think about the types of jobs that certain groups do, oftentimes there's masculine jobs and feminine jobs, which really doesn't have anything to do with the job itself. It's just historical. You know, for example, traditionally men have worked in construction. Women have worked in elementary school teaching, just as two examples. So men are often, young men are often dissuaded from going into things like elementary school teaching. There might be a stigma attached to that or nursing. Whereas women might be discouraged from going into construction or, you know, heavier industries. And that kind of occupational segregation is a form of discrimination if it's irrelevant. If being female or male is irrelevant to doing the job, then that would be considered a form of discrimination. Notice all three of these occur after entering the labor market. The person is making themselves available and they're seeing that one group gets more than another group. One group has better employment prospects than another group. One group is being ushered into certain occupations and the other group is being ushered into certain occupations. The last one actually occurs before entering the labor market. And this is human capital. The theory here is that there could be discrimination in uh, access to education and or the quality of education. Now, if we were to generalize, we would see that blacks historically have been disproportionately impacted by employment and human capital discrimination. Um, you're less likely to see differences in wages between whites and blacks in the same occupation as you would be likely to see employment differences between whites and blacks or human capital differences between whites and blacks. Females are disproportionately impacted by occupational segregation. Uh, again, you're less likely to see differences between males and females um, in, the, in terms of wage and employment. In fact, we saw the unemployment rate was almost the same um, for the nation between males and females. Uh, but you do see occupational segregation. For example, uh, a male uh, that is working in construction might actually make the same wage as a female, all else equal. But the female might have all these additional hurdles to getting into construction, the stereotype associated with it and the kind of resistance they might encounter to, you know, why, why do you want to be a construction worker? That's a man's job. Or alternatively, the male might have um, stigma attached to uh, being a school teacher. You know, why does that 21 year old male want to work with kindergartners? You know, what's going on there? Whereas a female might not have that same stigma attached to it. So that's a hurdle, right? And that's important because there's probably a lot of uh, women that would be very good construction workers and men that should never go near construction. And there's also a lot of women that shouldn't work with kids and some men that would be great with little kids. But the segregation sometimes creates that hurdle that is just insurmountable. All right. Uh, all types reinforce each other and can compound the overall effect. Uh, and this is where you see some groups that have just been historically disenfranchised, like blacks, um, the wage discrimination, the employment discrimination, the segregation into a heavy industry and lower income jobs and the lack of access to human capital. It's created an environment that's very unfertile to labor market prosperity. There are other examples of this kind of extreme disenfranchisement historically. Uh, you can look at Native Americans. You can look at the Chinese that came here uh, in the second wave of immigrants. Uh, personally, I, I also uh, note the, um, the Oklahoma kind of Midwest migration that occurred during the Great Depression. Um, some of you may have grandparents that came from <clears throat> the Midwest. I know my father did. And um, he grew up in an environment where uh, there was stigma attached to being uh, a Midwesterner, a 
farmer that came out here to California, uh, they couldn't get jobs. Uh, they were perceived as being dumb, dumb Okies, they called them. So they couldn't get a job. Um, the, the occupational segregation was they had to do the, the lowest level work possible. And um, they uh, got really low wages. In fact, a lot of them were attracted to coming to California by advertisements that said, oh, come out here. There's a lack of, of um, workers and you're going to get a high wage. But that was all a facade. The farmers out here, they, um, they tried to attract an increased supply of workers from the Midwest, knowing that there was this destitute population that would come here. Uh, they tried to attract them to drive wages down, which is exactly what they did. And uh, so there's a lot of examples of historical disenfranchisement. When you compound all these things together, you get people that are just um, in a really bad position uh, in the market. OK, let's talk about Becker's taste for discrimination model. We've discussed Gary Becker before and his contribution to uh, labor economics. This is just another example. Uh, he considers discrimination a preference that the discriminator will pay for. We're going to see that economic discrimination, where you're discriminating based on irrelevant characteristics of the job, actually harms the discriminator. It's going to create a smaller supply of workers driving up the wage they have to pay. That hurts output. That hurts, hurts profits. And so they must have some taste, some preference for discrimination to be willing to do this. And discrimination can arise from many sources. It doesn't just come from employers. Uh, that's where we focus because that's the most overt kind. You know, I'm not going to hire someone because of this, their gender or their race, and that's not relevant. Um, but consumers can discriminate. You could have an employer that, you know, maybe they own a restaurant and they say, well, I, I don't care. I just want the best workers. I don't care what gender they are or what race they are, um, but their customers do. And if their customers care, then they have to discriminate in order to attract customers. And then another example would be employees. You know, maybe the employer is not a discriminator. You know, you might, for example, in, in a, a firefighting environment, um, traditionally it's male oriented, right? Kind of the old boys club. And uh, so the fire captain might say, well, I need a new fire um, fireman or woman. They don't care. They'll hire a man or a woman. But they say, God, if I hire that woman, my other workers, they're not going to like that. They're the discriminators. I'm not. So it's important to note that discrimination can be pervasive even when employers are not directly discriminatory. They're forced to discriminate because of the consumers they're catering to or the employees that they're catering to, which actually makes discrimination a uh, more problematic kind of environment. Because even though we can implement regulation to say you cannot discriminate in the employment of certain groups, it's hard to prevent consumers from being discriminatory. Right. And it's hard for the government to prevent employees from being discriminatory. So often discrimination is hard to counter because the direct route is to go after employers. But there's these other forces that make discrimination more likely. All right. The discrimination coefficient, uh, a non-discriminatory employer will randomly hire comparable black and white workers. They pay whites the same as blacks. They would effectively be colorblind. Race would be irrelevant. A discriminatory employer, on the other hand, would only hire blacks at a lower wage. And the degree of prejudice would be measured by this coefficient. For example, if white workers, let's say, have a wage of $20, maybe the employer will hire blacks, but at only a wage of 18, which means that the discriminatory coefficient is $2 because 18 plus 2 would be 20. Um, they would be effectively indifferent to race if the wage that white workers make, $20, was equal to 18 for black workers plus the $2 discriminatory coefficient, or maybe uh, 16 for black workers and a $4 discriminatory coefficient, so on and so forth. Uh, the uh, whites would effectively be getting a higher wage by that discriminatory coefficient. We just rearranged this formula to show that if white workers make $20 and the discriminatory coefficient is, let's say, 4, then black workers would make 16. In other words, blacks would always make less than whites by the discriminatory coefficient. And that coefficient would range from 0 to infinity. If it's 0, then we're back to this, and whites make the same as blacks, no discrimination. But if it's infinity, then there is no wage at which blacks would be hired. In other words, even if they would supply their labor for free, the employer would not hire them at all. So we have a range from zero, a completely non-discriminatory employer, to infinity, a complete discriminator. Another way to look at this is graphically. This model here shows us 
the labor market for black workers. We have our demand curve, which I'll explain in a minute, looks like this, and we have our supply curve, traditional upward sloping. The wage that we're gonna put on the vertical axis though is not the actual monetary wage, it's gonna be the wage ratio. And the ratio is the black wage over the white wage. Now, if blacks make the same as whites, that is there's no discrimination, then this ratio would be one, right? If whites make 20 and blacks make 20 an hour, then 20 over 20 is one. And what we expect is that there would be a range of black workers where they would not experience any discrimination. And that range is represented by a horizontal demand curve. In other words, uh, black workers would be employed up to this point right here at the same wage as whites. Okay. So the horizontal portion represents non-discriminating employers. But then once we reach this point, we start to see a downward sloping demand curve. And what that implies is that beyond this point, blacks are starting to make a fraction of what whites make. Okay. For example, let's say, let's take this point right here on the demand curve. Let's say it's 0.8. Well, that means blacks would make 80% of what whites would make. Okay. and onward, right? 60%, 50% all the way down. Beyond this point, what we're getting is discriminatory demanders of labor, discriminatory employers. They're starting to create a discriminatory coefficient, meaning that blacks are getting a smaller fraction of pay than whites get, and this continues. Another way to think about this is that up to some point, we're getting blacks employed by non-discriminatory employers. But beyond some point, blacks are having to be employed, demanded by discriminatory employers. And the intersection of the supply curve with the demand curve is gonna tell us whether we actually see the discrimination in wages or not. For example, let's say this supply curve intersects the demand curve over here. Well, in that case, you'll notice the equilibrium is right here. So we would see whites making the same as blacks because the ratio is one and we'd have this quantity here. But as blacks enter the labor market, supply curve shifts to the right, we'll continue. As long as we have an intersection of supply and demand along this horizontal demand curve, then we're not going to see any wage discrimination. But as blacks continue to enter, notice now the equilibrium is moving to a lower ratio. So now we're going to start to see blacks making less than whites. And if it continues and the supply curve shifts way over here, we might actually see blacks making, you know, half or a, a, a low fraction of what whites are making. We can also identify the amount of discrimination by the employer based on the shape of the demand curve. The longer this horizontal portion is, the less discriminating employers there are and the less the slope of this downward portion, the less discriminating there is. I mean, optimally, you would want this downward sloping portion to become flatter and flatter until it becomes perfectly horizontal, in which case there is no discrimination. We can now generalize the results of the taste for discrimination model. Um, we know that white workers are going to gain uh, they're getting the higher wages compared to black workers. More generally, the white workers are having to compete with less workers, uh, and that keeps wages higher. Black workers lose. Obviously, they're getting the lower wages. They're getting that fraction of what white workers get. The employer loses. That's really the new information here that we get from the model. The discriminatory employer has to have a taste for discrimination because they're going to have to pay those higher wages to those white workers that result from the decreased competition of black workers. In essence, the firm is reducing the pool of workers, qualified workers, and therefore paying a higher wage as a consequence of that. You know, if you've got black workers and white workers and they're equally competent in terms of relevant characteristics and you say, I'm only going to hire the white workers, then you're going to have to pay a higher wage because you have less pool of workers to pull from. 
Competition could actually decrease discrimination because those firms that don't discriminate would have a larger pool of workers. They would have lower wages overall, and they could maybe outcompete the discriminating firms. Some believe that discrimination goes away over time through market forces. Generally, we don't believe that. That's why government has been involved. But market forces may be a factor 